what's happened since the last time one of the client seminars was on, so over the last probably six months. Then the process, how we select the funds in the first place. Then we'll have some proof of pudding. Look at some of the funds we've chosen in the past. Have they done well? Have they not done so well? And then some real life examples. We pick some clients, named being anonymous, and how they've done over a short, medium, and long term. Then actually, patient compounding, what our returns have been since we've running the portfolios. Then we're going to look at the risks. Are there any risks? It's a very, very uh, quiet time. There's no worries around the world. <laughs> and then uh, QA. We're going to have some, I love the phrase, we're going to grab a glass of spirits. I think that's a phrase I'm going to try and use more often. So, it was the 18th of November. It certainly wasn't the weather to go outside and grab a glass of screws. It was a bit more chilly. And putting in what's happened in those periods, we have our globe of events. So first off, everyone probably knows the gentleman. That's Donald Trump. Is he a hairdresser? <laughs> <laughs> An unsuccessful one, I would suggest. Now, in January, in our quarterly review, I wrote about risks that might happen, and one of the risks was political risk. And I said, quite insightfully, that Donald Trump wouldn't get anywhere near the White House. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't get everything right. Um, the lady to her, to his left, is Janet Yellen. She's probably the most important person in the world at this moment in time. She's the head of the Federal Reserve in the US. She's the head of their central bank. So she decides when to raise interest rates, she decides what policy and fiscal monetaries um, they're going to set. Now, in November, we're discussing when are they going to raise interest rates. And we, I said, I think it'll probably be December. It depends on the, the data, in particular the unemployment data. And in December, she did, she rose interest rates, which was fantastic. And then she became the most hated person because even though raising interest rates from a quarter of a percent to half a percent was the, probably the best thing to do. I mean, that's the emergency level interest rate. We're, we're above, we're away from that now. But what she did say was in the December statement there were going to be four interest rate rises in 2016. And that spooked the market massively. Now she's backtracked from that. As I've learned being married, there's different ways of being wrong. And <laughs> even though the interest rate rise was correct, saying there's going to be four more rate rises wasn't the right thing to do. The markets now expect the first rate rise in the US to be middle of 2017. <coughs> what else happened? <coughs> it's looking a bit smugger now. <laughs> Donald started winning some of the uh, primaries, getting more support. Hillary was very surprised. She'll probably be the Democrat candidate. Assad in Syria, so the Middle East was kicking off all over again. More terrorism, unfortunately. And no, that is not me. That's my <laughs> North Korean twin, King Il Un. Uh, sanctions were being imposed on North Korea, whatever good that's going to do. Then we had the announcement, what everyone was waiting for, that there was going to be a referendum on the UK staying in the EU. So David was taking up the mantle of the stay in campaign. And Boris, let's be honest, we can get some nice pictures of Boris, but we want a crazy picture of Boris. <laughs> Boris took up the mantle of, let's leave. And finally, we had the terrible atrocities in Brussels, as well as other acts of terrorism around the world. That's a constant threat. It's one of those things you can't really invest against. You just have to be prepared that there are going to be times where the markets are affected by things out of your control. And Mossack Fonseca, does that ring a bell to anyone? Mm -hmm. Panama Papers, list of all the great and the good and their offshore tax regimes, which, completely legitimate, but in the hands of the press, get turned into a massive stick to beat everyone with. So that's what happened over six months, we stay extremely quiet, and nothing went on really. And that's what the markets did in the last six months. January was pretty much falling down. At this point here, the 11th of February, straight back up again. It's only happened two times since the Second World War when we've had the first quarter be down by more than 10% and recover by more than 10%. 
2003 and 2009. And in both those instances, the markets went on to have exceptionally good years. That's the good bit of the presentation. That's the good news. Process. How do I go about picking funds? Now, as we all know, the acronym is PRETTY. It was named after Brian. <laughs> it still gets a lot. <laughs> it stands for Process, Returns, Expenses, Team Talent and Ideology. The first one is the process. How does the fund manager actually run money? Does the process he employ robust? Does he have a, a track to run on and he sticks to it whether it's in good times or bad times? Or does he capitulate? It's about making sure the money he runs is as robust as our process for picking the funds. It's the analogy of kicking the tires, looking under the bonnet. Is it, is it going to stand up to the test of time? Second one is returns. And it's not just how much money they've made in the past or how much money you think they're going to make in the future. It's the journey they take. It's how much risk they're taking on board. Are they looking to capture every single basis point and chase every single return? Or are they playing it steady and playing a much patient game? Expenses, obviously that's the important one. We want to make sure the funds we bring in are not overpriced. But also on expense for us. How much time it takes us to visit these guys. Are they based in London? Are they based in Leeds or Edinburgh? Are they based overseas? Team's critical. Is it one man by himself? <coughs> Has he got a group of analysts with him? Has he got a second in command? And with this as well, the fund group themselves, how do they treat this fund? Is it given the resource and support that it needs to flourish? Or is it left on its, on, on its own to wither? Talent sort of goes in hand in hand with team. What is, or who is, the key for this fund? And it might be the lead fund manager. It might have a star manager culture. It might be the second in command. It might be the one actually making the decisions. It might be a piece of proprietary software they have to analyse the market, and that's their key, unique selling point. But you have to dig deep to find this. And finally, it's their ideology. Are they deep value managers? Are they happy to buy those firms that look like they're dead and down and out, but they have a good management team and they're happy to hold on for three to five years for it to recover? Are they growth managers, happy to pay a high price, but expecting it to go higher? Are they income managers, looking for those firms who are going to pay out high dividends? Are they looking for small companies, large companies? Making sure we can identify who they are. And once you've done all that process work, you know exactly what the fund's like. Then you can bring in another fund, blend them together to get this diversification benefit. Does that make sense, guys? So the proof of the pudding. Some of the funds we've chosen in the past. We looked at the portfolios back on the 1st of November 2004, and this is one of the funds we had in our portfolios at the beginning. This is BlackRock Gold in general. It invests in gold. It will invest in gold mines and other miners. We sold on the 1st of November 2011. It had gone up 250%. I remember some of these guys going, but it's the best performing fund, why are we selling it? Gold had raced away. This was supposed to be a diversifier in our portfolios, doing something different to equities, doing something different to property, doing something to different to bonds. But it was coming more and more correlated to the stock market. It wasn't doing what we wanted to do. We were tracking it for a while, and probably for me the litmus <coughs> test came going shopping with my son and daughter, and there was a man willing to take my wedding ring and sell it to me there and then. Or I could pop it in an envelope in the post and get some money back. If I had told my nan to fill this envelope full of her jewellery and send it off, she would have thought I was crazy. It was the canary in the coal mine. He continued to do okay, but we did end up missing, thankfully, 70% drop. Interestingly, gold, has been the best performing asset class so far this year. But we still think that's a risky risk off trade. We expect that to drop down quite dramatically. Property, another one that we invested in from the very beginning. But in two years, it had gone up 80%. It wasn't behaving like we expected it to. It had broken our pretty process rules. We decided to sell. Uh, commercial. 
It continued to go up, so I need a little bit of humble pie for the next six months. But what we did, we avoided an almost an equal drop. At this point here, we sold our property entirely in our portfolios. But we continued to track the asset class, and where this chart finishes on May 2011, that's when we decided to go back into the uh, asset class. But not with this one, with this one. This is FNC UK property. It is dull, it is boring. It invests in good commercial properties with good tenants who pay good levels of rent. What you're seeing here, these little spikes down, that's protecting you and us. Every time someone wants to come into the fund, they drop the pricing, they pay more, and it comes back up. So you're not being disadvantaged. It's good management of the portfolio. UK, equities. you've got the, the turquoise line at the top, is BlackRock's UK Absolute Return Fund. It's, it's your armbands in the water. You're not going to drown, but you probably won't make too much money. The dark blue one is Thesis Cartesian UK Opportunities Fund, just rolls off the tongue. We sold them both a year and a half later, but for different reasons. Cartesian, we got wrong. They weren't doing exactly what we thought they'd do. The expectations were low. Dropping below the sector average here. They recovered a little bit here, but in the end, hands up, we got that one wrong. Time to get out. Also, we felt it was time to get out of this one as well, because this was at the time of the financial crisis. It just, as we weren't sure, but just finished. March 2009, May 2009, just seeing the bottom of the financial crisis. So we sold out them both for different reasons. Interestingly enough, the guy who was running this fund ended up going a little bit off the rails three or four years later and got done from inside the trade. What we did invest in was Keynes UK Opportunities Fund, steady fund, mainly mid cap. I'm going to blow the lights out, patient compounding with the funds they invested. As you can see at the end, the black line is the FTSE All Share, considerably beaten the FTSE All Share, considerably beaten Cartesian, what we invested in. Very new fund. This is Fidelity's Asia Pacific Opportunities, run by a guy called Anthony Schwann. <coughs> Only launched in 2014. Got an hour radar six months later. We were tracking him. The fund was a million pounds in size. It was tiny. Now, a lot of people won't invest in a fund until it's got to 50 or 100 million. A lot of people won't invest until he's got a track record of three years. We met with Anthony three or four times, and we decided to invest in July. At that point there, we own 90% of the fund. Since then, that fund has gone up 14%, and the market has gone down 6 It is the number one fund in Far East equities over that time period. It's about having faith in the managers and their process. The one thing that sold it for us, Fidelity was giving this guy all the resource he needed to make this fund work. America. Similar picture, Boomer Sales, tracking it for a while, we decided to invest in there. While the market's gone flat, these guys have put out a good 10% return. Proof of the pudding. So we can look at the rewards now, not those type of rewards, but the rewards some clients have made. We've got three examples of real life clients. I think that's the best one. <laughs> this is Mr. H. It might be one of you, I'm not too sure. Long term investor, been invested with us from launch, so over 11 years, and he's in portfolio 10. So his fund would have returned him around about 140%. Compared, oh, and these are the things he's had to endure during that time Middle East crisis in 2006, the global financial crisis in 2008, sovereign crisis in 2011. That's when the USA lost its AAA rating. <coughs> and we also had riots in London five years ago. It doesn't seem, doesn't seem like that. Eurozone breakup in the summer of 2012. Everyone thought the Eurozone was going to break up internally. QE ending in 2013. Another wobble for not raising interest rates. And then a wobble for raising interest rates. Compare that to the FTSE 100. A considerable gap. Compare that to the average fund that's got the same level of risk, massive gap. 
and we put inflation in there for you. Let's be honest, we're all looking to beat inflation, make sure that the value of our money doesn't erode over time. So that's our long-term example. Mr. D is our medium-term example. He's in portfolio five. He's been invested for just over five years. Again, he suffered the same sort of environment. Sovereign crisis, Eurozone, the taper tantrum. That's when the head of the Federal Reserve said, we're going to stop QE at some stage. You haven't got worried there. Here's the FTSE 100. Over the period, Portfolio 5 has beaten it, even though it's taken about half as much risk. That's the average of the fund, <coughs> and again, beating inflation. Finally, Mr. K, short term, they've been invested three years, this is Portfolio 2. Take the tantrum, QE ending, not raising interest rates, not managing the expectations that Janet Yellen saying there's going to be four rate rises. That's what the average fund has done, but it's beaten inflation over that period as well, which is critical. Even though it's taking considerably less risk than the FTSE 100, if we put the FTSE 100 in, you can see how volatile the last three years have been. The portfolio two, sizable gaps. That's been a smoother ride for this gentleman. <coughs> he wanted to take less risk. And these are our actual returns. Since launch, annualised returns for all the portfolios. Report, equip, portfolio 1 to 10, that's from the 1st of November 2004. The lighter gold bars, they are income portfolios. They launched in 2010. So they're over five years old now. As a comparison, that's what the FTSE 100 would have given you. So portfolio 6 and above, the FTSE is roughly just done a little bit better than 5. But interestingly, Bank account and inflation, 2% over nearly 12 years. Yes. Is that with fees taken out? It is, no, yes. Yeah, that's net fees. So you've gone through the rewards, you've got to balance it with a certain level of risk. You can't get these returns without accepting some volatility, some risk to your investments. And technology. Let's go east first. One of the biggest risks in the horizon is China. <coughs> they are a dominant factor. Even the US are wary over China. When you, when you read the minutes from the central banks... Oh, does anyone read the minutes from the central banks? <laughs> really? <laughs> Only me? <laughs> when I read the minutes from the central banks, Janet Yellen is very concerned about China. When she talks about global risks, she thinks she means China. Will it have a hard landing? Which is a way of saying, will it go into recession? No, we don't think so. It's not going back to growth of 14% every year. It's probably going to be around 6% per annum. But when the rest of the world is growing at 2, 6 sounds pretty good to me. They also transition their economy. Old China, where it was using up all the natural resources, coal, iron, copper, big factories, big smokestacks, they're moving away from that. They're going into the service industry, a lot of internet stuff. They're just transitioning. It's a tough time for China. But that's going to be an interesting place to invest in the next two or three years. Somewhere where we are currently invested, Japan. You know, we started investing in Japan four years ago, mainly on the back of they had to stimulate the economy. They had to do a lot of QE. They've done more QE than the US and the UK have put together. Now, at the moment, their central bank, Karuda, he's playing funny games with the markets. Where he should be stimulating more, he's sort of playing a waiting game. We still think a long-term investment is great, but we think <coughs> over the next six months, China, uh, Japan probably has a bit more risk than we'd like, but it's a long-term investment. We're not here to dip in and out. We take the small bumps along the way. <coughs> we go west to Europe. Wow, way to pick. Let's go Greece first. Hey, guess what? They can't repay their debt. So that's coming up in two months' time. And there's talk of giving them some sort of relief on their debt. So that's going to hit the market, the headlines again soon. Spain. Now they've done a lot of hard work to make their economy better, but their coalition at the moment looks incredibly shaky. So there's a lot of political uncertainty there. Italy. 
their banks are in big trouble. They're going to need a bigger bailout. That's a shock there. France. All these structural reforms they're going to put in place. Changing the retirement age. Changing employment law. They've, they've sort of gone back on that. They're not really going to do anything. Germany. Angela Merkel. Probably the one leader in all of Europe who survived the global financial crisis. Her approval rating is at an all-time low. Whether she survives again is a big question. And the UK. Brexit. That's the nearest risk on our horizon. <coughs> Found this a couple of days ago. Google Trends. Anyone heard of Google Trends? It is brilliant. Type in Google Trends and it says, what would you like to look at? And you can put in cats. And it'll tell you how many people are searching cats at a particular time. So I put in leave EU and stay in EU. And you can see, pretty low. Until we hit here, and this is the announcement from David Cameron when the uh, referendum is going to be. So here we have three times as many people Googling leave the EU than stay in the EU. And that might not mean anything. If you go into the Financial Times referendum picture gram, it's 46% stay, 44% leave, and whatever the middle bit is. <laughs> Which I don't deal with numbers. <laughs> what do the experts say? We had, oh, see, we had, look at these. In the flesh, some of you lucky people might be able to make one of these. So we had three different reports out pretty much within the same week. Centre for Economic and Importance here. We had the um, CBI, and we also had Oxford Economics saying the implications of leaving the EU. And every single one pretty much said the same thing. If we leave the EU, it all depends on what trade agreement we can get in place. And the trade agreement that looks the same as pretty much we've got now will be the best. Now, funnily enough, the campaign for leaving debunks all these campaign for leaving comes out of something, the campaign for staying debunks that. It's a bit playground politics at the moment. But what we see in the marketplace, in these lovely graphs, this is sterling. So from here to there, it's against the dollar, that's against the euro. Sterling's depreciated significantly. This is the most interesting one here, or for me anyway. The darker line is shorting the market. That's investors betting the stocks will go down. The lighter line is buying stocks and betting the stocks are going to go up. You can see there's been a massive increase in the amount of people thinking the stock market is going to go down between now and the vote. This is what's actually happening. This is the volatility index. They call it the fear gauge. Here and here, that's when people are worried. But at the moment, the market's fairly sanguine. There's nothing to panic about just yet. And this chart here is the European stock market last summer when we were all worried about Greece. That was the D-Day massive rally. It's not all doom and gloom, but expect to hear a lot more about Brexit going forward. But what it's all about. It's about Morris versus Dave. I'd love to say I came up with that, I really wouldn't. <coughs> In the green corner, green for go, it's going to be about migration, and it's going to be about cost. Very much like the general election, it's going to be fought on two or three things. David, in the red corner for stock, it's going to be about security, and it's going to be about the economy. They're the main, main areas. But once we've got through the 23rd of June, that's the biggest risk really. US politics. He's gone from there to there. <laughs> He's going to build his wall across everywhere. He hasn't ruled out nuking Europe. And his foreign policy is going to be a guarded secret. He doesn't want to tell everyone what he's doing. Goodness me. But politics is probably the biggest thing you have to worry about. Now, that's not an advert for the Euro 2016. 
is about different parties coming to the fore across some of the major areas in Europe. We've already seen with Greece. We've got Alexis Tsipras, who came through, and Yanis Karakousis. Took me a long time to remember those names. <laughs> uh, in Spain, this is the head of their anti-austerity party. That's Pablo Iglesias. In Italy, there's two guys. I'm not making these up. That's Beppe Giallo. And in a previous life, he was a clown. <laughs> Seriously, he was a circus clown. A bit like Trump. <laughs> and we've got uh, Matteo Salvini. Trump's on the, uh, I think that's the Italian equivalent of GQ, I'm not entirely sure. He's head of Liga Nord, anti-austerity, both want to be out of the euro. EU. Marine Le Pen. Very left-wing, very anti-EU, very anti-austerity. These guys are getting traction. Although recently, they've been managed to push back from the votes they've had. We're seeing more and more come through. Politics has to be the number one risk that faces our portfolios at this time. It's a hard one to invest for. It's something we can't necessarily avoid or there's a particular fund that's going to benefit from these. We just have to make sure we understand the implications of these guys get in and what the odds of, odds of these guys get in as well. Did you say Marie Pen is left wing? All right. I, I get confused. I'm, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know that is the end of the presentation.